Well, good evening and happy new year and welcome to our first Sunday fireside chat of 2022. Tonight, our speaker is going to take us back to World War II and to a place called Yalta in the Soviet Union. Uh, many of you, in fact, probably all of you have heard about Yalta, and it's hard to overestimate the importance of the Yalta Conference. Uh, there we had the three most powerful leaders in the world, Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. They were there to figure out how to divide up post-war Europe. And uh, Catherine looks at the Yalta Conference through the eyes of three young women. And those are Anna Roosevelt, Franklin's daughter, and uh, Sarah Churchill, Winston's daughter, along with Pamela Harriman, who was the daughter of the US ambassador to the Soviet Union. And uh, Catherine points out that uh, all these women had one attribute that no one else at the conference had, uh, no diplomat or no delegate. They had the full trust of the, their fathers. So they got to hear a lot of very amazing information that most people weren't able to hear. And The Daughters of Yalta is Catherine's first book and what a debut. So uh, Catherine, take it away. Thank you so much, David, and thank you to Jed for the lovely invitation to be here this evening. It is uh, fortuitous that I was able to be home during this period. I'm uh, in law school in my second year, and they moved us all virtual for the month of January. So it's a great silver lining to join you all. I grew up in Winneka and went to New Trier, and so it's really in the midst of this very odd time to be able to be here kind of and have the support of the local community where I grew up has really made all of this experience of publishing my first book in trying times all the more special. So thank you all so much for having me and for coming this evening. So I, I love to get started with this uh, famous photograph from the Second World War and uh, just to kind of frame a little bit of the context behind the story. And for those of you who've read the book or know this history inside and out, so <laughs> I'm sure you know this all already, um, but this is the famous photograph of the big three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin with their military advisors behind them. And it was taken uh, during the Yalta conference in February, 1945. And this is one of those pictures that graces the cover of textbooks and history books of the period. And you can really see just how much of the, the weight of the world they have on their shoulders. You can see the lines in their faces and this uh, expression of just exhaustion that they have after half a decade at war. And much of this comes from the issues that they have come to Yalta to discuss. First, uh, the Battle of the Bulge has just ended and it looks like the war in Europe will finally draw to a close sometime in the late spring or early summer of 1945. And now the race is on among the three Allied armies to see who will be the first to liberate Berlin. And with that brings some pressing questions. The first is what to do about Germany in the post-war period. Will Germany be allowed to remain one country or will it be broken up into a group of smaller countries in hopes that they can't rise up as a belligerent for a third time in half a century? Also incredibly important in Europe, uh, as, uh, especially to Winston Churchill, is the future of Poland and Polish sovereignty. Britain went to war to defend Polish sovereignty at the outset of World War II, and he doesn't want to learn, uh, return home to London and look the Polish government that's been in exile in London ever since uh, in the eye and say they weren't able to secure that which they went to defend in the first place. Poland is also incredibly important to Stalin, and he has some other ideas here. He looks at Poland and the, the plains and the flatlands of this area as a source of weakness. And this is the same weakness that has been present all the way back to the czarist period and the Napoleonic era. The Soviet Union and Russia before has been invaded multiple times, starting with Napoleon through this, these flatlands. And Stalin wants to make sure that when the war is over, after all the sacrifices of the Red Army, that he has friendly neighbors, as he calls it, on his borders, that the government in Poland is going to be friendly to the interests of the Kremlin. Also extremely important uh, right now versus the war in the Pacific, which is not nearly as far advanced as the war in Europe. They don't yet know if the atomic bomb will be an option. Iwo Jima has not yet happened. That takes place just after Yalta. And Roosevelt is looking at the potential need for a ground invasion of the Japanese home islands, which could lead to the deaths of potentially 200,000 American soldiers. His priority is saving as many American lives as possible. And to do this, he wants to draw the Soviet Union into the war. Uh, in exchange for certain territorial concessions that Stalin has long had his eye on. Also incredibly important to Roosevelt is the founding of the United Nations, this uh, organization dedicated to securing world peace. 
He wants to succeed where Woodrow Wilson failed at the end of World War I with the League of Nations and create an organization that can secure peace, perhaps not forever, as that's probably a foolhardy dream, but at least peace in Europe for at least 50 years. In order for this to be a, a meaningful project, however, he really needs the Soviet Union's cooperation and buy-in to make it a, a success. So that gives you a little bit of the context for some of the issues on the table and why they look so exhausted at this moment. But what's also very telling and something that I didn't realize until I started working on this book is how much of that exhaustion also came from what it took to physically get to Yalta. At this point, Stalin recognizes that he holds more cards than do his allies. And so if they wanna meet, they're going to have to come to him. He claims he can't travel because his doctors have advised him that it's bad for his health. However, the reality is that he's paranoid about leaving his security apparatus. Uh, he's also very afraid of flying and is superstitious, so he doesn't want to leave his own borders. Meanwhile, the reality and the sad irony is that Franklin Roosevelt is the one who's very ill and should not be traveling, yet he and Churchill agree to make this arduous journey. Churchill has to fly 1,300 miles from London, first to Malta, where he rendezvous with FDR. And very tragically, on the way to Malta, one of the advanced planes carrying members of the British Foreign Office, who are experts specifically briefed for this conference, uh, the plane crashes off the coast of Italy, and several of these experts are killed, which really casts a shadow over the beginning of the conference for the British. Roosevelt, meanwhile, has to make a week-long journey by a uh, destroyer convoy across the Atlantic Ocean, and they're still sighting enemy U-boats as they travel. This is not a safe journey by any means. And I think it just highlights how important it was that they felt to, to meet in person that they're willing to take on this risk, something that no security advance team would ever allow the president and prime minister to make today. Churchill and Roosevelt then fly another almost 1400 miles over enemy occupied islands where there are still anti-aircraft units. One of the advanced planes actually gets its shale, tail shot up by these air, anti-aircraft units. And then they finally make it to the Crimea where they land at a runway that is dangerously short for the type of planes that they fly and an airfield that is shrouded in fog. And then they have to drive another six hours, sometimes over battle scarred roads at no more than 20 miles an hour until they finally, finally reach Labadia Palace. Lavadia Palace was the summer home of Tsar Nicholas II and his family during the Romanov period. But this, of course, uh, this era met a tragic end, as did the Romanov family uh, when they were brutally murdered during the Russian Revolution. His one time beautiful summer palace that had been the family home uh, for the Romanovs, where they would swim and play tennis and ride horses, passed to the hands of the Soviets, who used this once beautiful building as a uh, rest home for favored Soviet workers. Mm -hmm who needed relaxation and time to recuperate. Uh, this changed hands again uh, when the Nazis invaded the Crimea and the Nazis used this as their Crimean headquarters. The Soviets managed to push the Nazis out just weeks before the Yalta conference, but on their way, the Nazis stripped the palace of absolutely everything they could carry, all of the furniture, the lamps, the dishes, literally down to the doorknobs, which they could strip out and use as scrap metal. The Soviets have just three weeks from the time that they, the three delegations agree that this is where they're going to meet to frantically restock this villa and make it fit for one of the most important meetings in world history. So what they do is they take the contents of glamorous hotels in Moscow, like the Hotel Metropole, which some of you might be familiar with from Amor Toll's wonderful novel, A Gentleman in Moscow, and they cart the contents of these hotels a thousand miles south by train. So when they arrive, the, the dishes are emblazoned with that distinctive Metropole M, the maids' uniforms, everything. It's clearly come from the hotel. And while they make Herculean efforts and really do turn this place into a site fit for a hugely important diplomatic meeting, they're not quite able to push out some of the other residents of the building, these being bedbugs who were very difficult to evict. The advance team spray everything in DDT, which we now realize was not a great idea. Um, there are still a few lingering bed bugs and of course bugs of another variety, this being the electronic version as this is indeed the Soviet Union and there is always something listening. So this gives a little bit of the context for where they're meeting. And also I really think that the setting is such a palpable figure in the story itself, almost like its own character. And that Lavania Palace is much kind of a personification in a way of the Soviet Union at the time where you have this beautiful facade, everything looks like it's functioning well on the outside, but if you look just behind the surface, things look very different and it requires someone on the ground to really understand what the reality is like. So that's a little bit more of the, the story behind this photograph, but what I think is most interesting about this picture is actually looking at it in comparison with another. Another photograph that was taken just moments uh, apart and it shows a slightly different scene as you can see it from a very slightly different angle. And you can see off to the side are actually two young women. 
These are uh, Sarah Churchill, who is 30 years old. She's the daughter of the prime minister and Kathleen Harriman, who is the 27 year old daughter of the ambassador of the Soviet Union, April Harriman. There was of course a third daughter, Anna Roosevelt. Uh, she's just outside the frame of this picture, but you can see her on newsreel footage of the same scene. And this photograph is one that I had never seen before in all the time that I had been studying the Yalta Conference. You know, in school, I had no idea that these daughters had been there, but this picture brought several questions to mind. First was of all the people that these men could have brought with them to serve as their aides at Yalta, what was so important and specifically useful about the skills and abilities and backgrounds of these daughters that made them the perfect partners for their fathers in this moment on the precipice between World War and Cold War? And perhaps more importantly, we have this notion of these great men of history who we put up on a pedestal to the extent that they become almost more than human. And yet at the, some, at the end of the day, they're also someone's dad. And what would it be like to be their child and to be with them on the forefront of history? So these are some of the questions that were running through my mind as I was beginning to research this story and the questions that really framed the story for me as I was beginning to put the pieces together. Before I introduce each of the daughters to you in a bit more detail, uh, I want to introduce you to someone else. This is me in third grade. <laughs> um, I have loved history since I was tiny. Uh, before I can remember, I, I loved history. And I was really fortunate to grow up in a family that really put a huge emphasis on reading and storytelling and using your imagination. My mom would read to us aloud every night before bed and for hours on the porch in the summertime and we would read classics like uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Secret Garden, A Little Princess, you know, of course, for the Harry Potter stories. And so all of these books really did create a you know, robust imagination in each of us. And my mom also always loved history and world affairs. And so these are the things that we would talk about over dinner conversations at home. My grandfather served as an officer in the Navy during World War II. And from the time I was about seven years old, I was the family self-appointed historian and I would chase my grandfather around with a notepad and ask him to tell me the stories of growing up in Montana during the Great Depression, coming east for college and then serving in the Navy during the war. And these stories really resonated with me, especially as I watched some of my favorite movies like The Sound of Music and White Christmas and The Great Escape. And those stories really captured my imagination as well. So I think it was a surprise to no one that when I grew up and went to college that I became a history major. This is me the morning that I turned in my senior thesis at Harvard and inspired by my love of The Great Escape, I decided to write my thesis about British prisoner of war escape narratives and their place in British culture, uh, kind of akin to the Western cowboy hero that we have here. What I didn't realize that I would soon be spending quite a lot of time with Winston Churchill because I did not know he actually uh, escaped from a Boer POW camp during the Boer War in 1899 when he was just 24 years old. And it was the story of this thrilling escape that launched him to fame in Britain and jumpstarted his political career. But his account of his escape was the first of these uh, POW escape narratives that become so important in Britain over the next uh, 40 years. And uh, these are the stories that I became fascinated by and wrote about. And so my roommate thought it was hilarious that I had 125 books checked out from the library. Uh, she was a science major, so she never went to the library. <laughs> so she took this picture of me with all these books uh, the morning I turned in the thesis. I would soon be spending quite a bit more time with Winston Churchill unexpectedly. Uh, I had the opportunity then to go to Cambridge after I graduated and do a master's in modern European history. And for a history person, there is no better place to be than Cambridge where history surrounds you at every turn. It's literally the environment in which you are is the environment where the things I was studying unfolded and it was exciting to, to go down to London or to walk the streets of Cambridge and think about the issues I was writing about. And what I was writing about was uh, early modern counterintelligence practices as they emerged in Britain during World War I, kind of the first massive program of counterintelligence, which was based around reading the mail. Uh, in hopes of finding enemy German spies in their midst or in World War I, the uh, British government began reading all the in and outbound foreign mail and looking for enemy German spies. And the person overseeing this program was none other than the Home Secretary at the time, Winston Churchill. So here I was with all this time in beautiful idyllic Cambridge, but I soon uh, thought, hmm, maybe I should do what all my friends are doing, the typical recent grad adventure and move to New York and work in finance and trade in the hustle and bustle of Cambridge for New York City, uh, which of course has its merits, but is just a bit different. So I went to work in finance. I was working at BlackRock as a financial analyst in the Alternative Investments Group. So it's a little bit different than what I've been doing the last few years. But by sheer co coincidence, in the lobby of my office in Manhattan was a bookstore called Chartwell Booksellers. 
Chartwell Booksellers is named after the country home of Winston Churchill, and this bookstore specializes in books by and about the British Prime Minister. So I'd find myself, uh, when I'd go down to get a coffee in the lobby, just wandering into the bookstore, looking at the books that I'd spent so much time with, looking at others that I hadn't encountered before, and chatting with the owner about history and how much I missed it. And before long, he suggested that I should meet a group called the International Churchill Society. They were having a meeting across the street from my office at the Waldorf featuring Madeleine Albright as a keynote speaker. I thought, gosh, I would love to hear her, to learn from her. I said, if they need someone to check coats or show people to their table, I'd love to volunteer to do that, to hear Secretary Albright speak. And very kindly, they said, no, just come on over. We'd love to have someone who's excited about history come and join us. So off I went to this dinner and didn't realize that my life was about to change. Uh, at the dinner, I met members of the Church of Society who are uh, academics, and professors, but also professionals of all walks of life that want to encourage people to study history and to go into foreign service and diplomacy kind of in the spirit of Winston Churchill, but also members of the Churchill family. And it was shortly thereafter that they were opening the papers of Churchill's daughter, Sarah, to outside researchers for the first time. And they asked if I'd be interested in writing an article about her for their magazine. And I said, yes, just thinking this would be a fun way to stay engaged with history, do a little bit of writing. Meanwhile, I was applying to law school. But the other reason I was so interested in doing this was because I had had an experience of sorts with Sarah Churchill from the time I was a little girl. My family has gone to the cloister in Sea Island, Georgia, every summer since I was a baby. And on the wall of the lobby is this beautiful photograph of Sarah Churchill from her wedding day. She eloped to Sea Island with her second husband in 1949, and they got married. And so I walked past this picture of Sarah getting married at Sea Island, literally since I was a year old. And I'd always stopped and wondered about the prime minister's daughter and if, what it would have been like to be his child. And here was my chance to find out. Reading Sarah's papers, I quickly became fascinated by her life and career, but especially her relationship with her father. If people today know Sarah Churchill, it's often that she'd been an actress and a dancer and had starred in a movie with Fred Astaire called Royal Wedding in 1951. But it was really the work that she had done during the war and the relationship with her father and the special opportunities that that brought that I found most interesting. Sarah had a really close relationship with her father from the time she was a little girl. She would say that she could walk in silent step with him, following along his every thought. Even if he wasn't speaking, she understood what he was thinking. And much of this came from the long hours that they would spend together in the garden outside their home Chartwell, where Churchill would be engaged in one of his favorite pastimes, which was bricklaying, which he would do to relax. And Sarah would be out there in the garden with him as his second mate, uh, helping mix the cement, make sure the, uh, the plumb line was straight, and keeping his, him company. And they would engage in conversation, you know, followed by long periods of silence. And Sarah really came to understand the way his mind worked better than anyone except for her mother, Clementine. Sarah was also very much like her father and had his rebellious spirit and this desire to make a name for herself in the world on her own terms, which as a woman of that, that class and generation was very difficult. She couldn't have gone to university. Uh, there were very few careers open to her, but one thing she thought that she might do was become an actress. So this is what she decided. She was gonna chart her own course and become an actress. And while many fathers might have been thoroughly scandalized by the suggestion, Churchill was probably broken in a bit by his own mother, uh, the American debutante Jenny Jerome, who was a very scandalous woman in her times. She would write plays for London's West End. Uh, she was rumored to have a snake tattooed around her wrist and to have had scores of lovers. So just being an actress by comparison was relatively tame. So he did support her. Uh, however, she soon fell in love with the star of her show, a man named Vic Oliver, who was significantly older than she was and also an Austrian citizen, which made Churchill very concerned as he was seeing the winds of change on the continent and was worried what might happen to Sarah if she was married to an Austrian citizen. Uh, but she threw caution to the wind and decided to elope with him to New York and they married on Christmas Eve and very romantic ceremony. Uh, but the marriage sadly broke down quickly, which coincided with the outbreak of war and Sarah's father becoming prime minister. In order to regain her sense of identity and independence, Sarah decided to leave acting aside and do her bit for the war, uh, especially to support her father. So Sarah decided to join the women's branch of the Royal Air Force as an intelligence officer. And she became uh, an aerial reconnaissance intelligence officer, which involved looking at pictures taken by recon pilots at thousands of feet in the sky and making intelligence assessments based on these photographs, looking at uh, harbors to see enemy ships and determining what kinds of ships they were based on the shadows that they cast, or looking at fields of grass that had been trampled and determining was this an enemy troop movement that had trampled the grass or just some cows grazing that uh, made it look that way. 
So this is what Sarah was doing for the first part of the war. When uh, and the, the one of my favorite little <laughs> examples of the relationship between Sarah and Winston uh, came through some of this work that she was doing, where she went home on leave one weekend, traveled down by motorcycle, and she went to see her father right away before dinner. And he said to her, "At this moment, go sailing towards the Mediterranean, 542 ships." And she says, "Ah, Papa, I believe it's actually 543 ships." And he says, how do you know that? And she said, well, I've only been working on it for the last six months. This was Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. And Churchill was simultaneously a myth that she hadn't told him, to which she responded, I do believe there's something of security. And uh, he was also incredibly proud of her. So he went down to dinner and regaled his guests with this story. And one of the guests that evening happened to be Eleanor Roosevelt, who was so charmed by this uh, pride of the prime minister and his daughter that she went and told the story to the press the next day. Sarah soon followed her, found herself called in front of her superiors back on her base. They demanded to know who had told Mrs. Roosevelt the story and leaked it to the press. And Sarah could only say, I'm so sorry, but it was my father, the prime minister, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. <laughs> So Sarah soon had an opportunity to join her father and contribute in an even more meaningful way to his work when he asked her to join him as his aide de camp for the first meeting of the big three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin at Tehran at the end of 1943, where they laid the groundwork for the invasion of the Western Front, uh, the Normandy D-Day invasions. And Sarah was really the perfect choice to accompany him for several reasons. Early in the war, Winston and Clementine had decided when he traveled abroad, that someone from the family should go with him as a protector and confidant of sorts. And also as an unofficial family historian, they wanted, they knew that Churchill would want to write his wartime memoirs when it was over. And so they needed someone there to capture the details of what was taking place behind the scenes outside of the official minutes. And Sarah was a beautiful writer, had so much of her father's gift for language. So she was really the perfect choice for this. Also as an actress, uh, her training lent itself extremely well to, dip to diplomacy, which is very much like acting, uh, some of the, the double speak and the nuances. And she was able to uh, go and deliver subtle messages kind of with this actress's deportment. And also the fact that she had served in the military, she was very aware of the importance of the military operations. And also this really deep connection that she had with her father. And as David mentioned, the implicit trust that he had in her. It was uh, fundamentally important to him in an environment where he really couldn't trust anyone outside of his family. Sarah carried out her duties with aplomb as this daughter diplomat and her work there inspired two other fathers to think about bringing their daughters to other meetings in the future. The first of these was April Harriman, who has, had recently become the ambassador to the Soviet Union. April Harriman is someone who was fundamentally important to the 20th century, but one that I think a lot of people have forgotten about today. Uh, however, he was one of the wealthiest men in America in his day. He was the chairman of Union Pacific Railroad, the founder of Brown Brothers Harriman. He owned shipping conglomerates, manganese mines around the world. Uh, he was one of the owners of Newsweek magazine and also the creator of Sun Valley, which was the first American glamorous ski resort, which he opened as a way to encourage people to use his trains to travel out west by giving them a glamorous destination. April Harriman had two daughters, Mary and Kathleen, but he was not especially involved in their lives when they were little girls, as he was always off uh, tracking down business opportunities, traveling around the world, and he and his wife divorced when they were very small. He didn't come back into their lives in a meaningful way until they were teenagers, when their mother died. And he offered them an interesting opportunity, one that I think is very ahead of its time uh, for a man in his position. And he said to them, I do believe that we can become the best and finest of friends while recognizing that he would never be a warm and fuzzy father by any means as that wasn't in his nature. But he made them an offer and he said that he wanted them to become involved in his work to whatever extent that it interested them to come in and join his business to help out as they wanted to. His older daughter, Mary, was not especially interested in this, but his younger daughter, Kathleen, who was very much like him in temperament and spirit, jumped at the chance. And she and her father soon formed the foundation for a partnership that would see them through the rest of World War II. Uh, this began first at Sun Valley, which became this place of fundamental importance to both of them, where Kathleen would spend her winter and summer vacations in college there, helping him uh, carry out a number of different uh, operational duties at Sun Valley, from seeing to, uh, overseeing the comfort of uh, 
famous guests, uh, Hollywood movie stars, Ernest Hemingway, Hemingway, making sure they were properly taken care of, also doing espionage on counter uh, on other nearby resorts that had popped up, um, also taking care of publicity, assessing slope conditions. She really was a uh, person who could do it all. And they formed this really close bond through their love of outdoors and sport and adventure. Kathleen, much like her father, was an expert equestrian, a crack shot. She was even an Olympic level skier and would have represented the United States as an alternate on the ski team in the 1940 Olympics, which ultimately were canceled. But when World War II broke out and April Harriman, who had joined the New Deal administration, was tapped to become the Lend Lease envoy in London at the beginning of 1941, he thought to himself, gosh, this would be a great opportunity for my 23 year old daughter to come with me in the middle of the Blitz to London and to become a war reporter. So he works with Harry Hopkins, FDR's uh, special uh, advisor to make this possible. And Kathleen arrives in London just after the worst night of the bombing that London had yet seen. In London, April and Kathleen become very close friends with the Churchill family. Uh, one Churchill in particular, this being Pamela Churchill, the prime minister's young daughter-in-law who's married to his son, Randolph. And Kathleen and Pamela become best friends. But Kathleen soon realizes there's more than meets the eye here as Pamela, who is two years younger than Kathleen is, has become, uh, he's, she's started an affair with Kathleen's father, April. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that story. Uh, but the, the bond between the families really is deeper than that. And the two families are celebrating Kathleen's 24th birthday together on December 7th, 1941, when they all learn the news about Pearl Harbor. And that's pretty incredible to think about. April becomes the ambassador of the Soviet Union in 1943, and Kathleen decides to remain with him and continue her adventure at his side where she moves to Moscow, learns to speak Russian for both of them, really knowing he wouldn't have time and in many ways becomes his assistant ambassador. And goes on to become the American woman who has more access to and experience with Stalin and his inner circle than any other American woman in history. When it comes time for Yalta, April knows that Kathleen is the perfect person to accompany him as his aide. Because she speaks Russian, she can work with the Soviet advance team to make sure all the preparations are in order for the Americans. Uh, kind of like a protocol officer at the State Department today, I think that's the, the closest comparison, where uh, she's working with the Soviet and American advance teams to iron out any cultural difficulties, um, making sure everything is in order for the president in his wheelchair to be able to, to be mobile throughout the conference. And she writes a uh, very helpful description and uh, piece of information for the American diplomats who are coming over who've never been to the Soviet Union about their culture and customs, the history of the local area, which is very helpful for them as they're arriving on the scene. And what I love about this picture is this is not just a picture of Kathleen with any old horse, but this was actually a horse that was given to her as a gift by Joseph Stalin in recognition for her service during the war. And uh, it's uh, very few people can say that they have a horse that was a personal gift from Stalin. The third daughter, of course, was Anna Roosevelt. And at 38, Anna was the oldest of the three daughters and also the only mother among them. And I love this picture of Anna and FDR because it's one of the very few that we have of FDR standing. This was before his uh, polio paralysis. And it's, you know, I think really reflected the very special and deep bond that Anna had with her father from the time that she was a little girl. They had this shared passion for nature and the environment. And Anna wrote about her wonderful memories of going for long horseback rides through their pastures and fields in the Hudson River Valley in New York, around their home at Hyde Park. And Franklin would teach Anna about nature and preservation. And she dreamed that someday she would grow up to become the co-custodian of sorts of their home uh, in Hyde Park. But of course, all of this changed when he became paralyzed and Anna suddenly found herself pushed aside and on the outside looking in. Now Franklin was surrounded all the time by doctors and nurses and his political colleagues who had to come to him. Meanwhile, she was sent away to school, which she detested. Uh, she was forced to become a debutante, despite the fact her parents ridiculed this world. Uh, they still expected their daughter to participate in it. She then went to Cornell briefly uh, before leaving to make a rebellious marriage at age 20 to a man named Curtis Dahl. And she had two children soon after, but the marriage quickly broke down. However, she did soon fall in love uh, again on the campaign trail. Uh, however, this was with a Republican journalist who worked for one of FDR's chief critics, William Randolph Hearst. Uh, this is the journalist, John Bodiger, and they had this whirlwind romance, which is a great secret uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, but I just think it is uh, a perfect example in this fraught political times that love still can conquer all. Mm -hmm. So Anna and John get married, they move out to Seattle, they have another baby, and they become the editors of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer newspaper. 
1943, during the war, John decides to leave the paper and join up with the army. He goes out to the Mediterranean. And Anna decides rather than stay out in Seattle by herself, that she'll move home to be with her family. And this, of course, uh, home at this time means the White House. So she arrives at Christmas 1943. And she notices something's not quite right about her father. He's sitting there with his mouth hanging open for long periods of time, almost like he can't get enough air. He's just not as sharp on the details as she remembered him being. It's just little things that if you saw him every day, you probably wouldn't notice. But because she hadn't seen him for a long time, these were big changes and she became very alarmed. By March of 1944, she insisted he have a comprehensive medical examination to which he surprisingly agreed. And so he goes in to see the doctor in March of 1944. And the result is that he is in fact dying of congestive heart failure, which is a uh, relatively uh, new uh, disease that people begin to understand around this time. At the time, uh, there's really no treatment for it other than prescribing rest and relaxation and a healthier diet. And Anna and the doctor are sworn to secrecy about his diagnosis. They can't tell anyone. And curiously, FDR never once asks what's wrong with him. So it really falls to Anna to, sh to shoulder the burden of the secret. And even Eleanor, who knows there's something not right, can't bring herself to really grapple with the concept that he's dying and uh, is not well. And this is just something that she just can't see. So it really falls to Anna to become the gatekeeper in the White House for FDR. She becomes uh, very involved in deciding who really needs an audience with the president, who can go and meet with someone else. Uh, she sometimes goes through his papers at night in his inbox and decides which ones need his attention and which ones she can distribute to other people. And whether or not she should have been doing this is something that we can debate, but she's doing it with the sole intention of keeping her father alive. For years, Anna had wanted to join her father on one of his uh, overseas meetings uh, during the war, but FDR had always you know, said, no, you can't come with me, and instead had chosen to bring one of his four, uh, her four younger brothers, really his physical supporters to help him stand and move, but he never really gave a great uh, reason why she couldn't come and help him as well. He'd come up with all sorts of excuses like women can't be on Navy ships, you're not in uniform, <laughs> she was a, you're the president, you can make this change anytime you want. And both Eleanor and Anna wanted to be more involved and he kind of held them both at an arm's length, which is surprising when you think of how progressive he was and his reputation today. But there are these incredible letters between Anna and Eleanor where they're saying that FDR thinks that troublesome women should only be appeased from time to time and otherwise should be left at home to keep the home fires burning, which is uh, quite surprising. Uh, but by January 1945, FDR realizes that even if he doesn't know what's wrong with him, that Anna is clearly doing something to protect him and that he really can't get along without her anymore. So he cables his friend Winston Churchill and says, if you're thinking of bringing your daughter to uh, Sarah to this conference again, I'm thinking of bringing my daughter Anna. So Anna finally has her chance to be the person of utmost importance at his side, this position that she's yearned to recapture from the time she was a little girl. And she knows that she's finally succeeded. She's going to be in the room with him. However, she also knows this is probably the last opportunity to be with him in any meaningful way because he's dying. And it really falls to her to keep him physically alive throughout this trip. Meanwhile, carrying this horrible secret in addition to another one uh, that she's keeping from her mother, which I won't spoil now. I love this picture of the three daughters together at Yalta because I think it shows a little bit of their unique personalities. You can see Sarah in the end on her in her uh, military great coat, Anna in the middle in a sensible tweed, and Kathleen on the end in an elegant fur. But I think even though there are these distinct reasons that their fathers brought each of them to Yalta, which were you know a bit different, they all occupy a similar position that I like to think of as daughter diplomat where they're not there in an official capacity like someone from the State Department or the Foreign Office might be, but they speak with the weight of their fathers behind them, which allows them to go and deliver subtle nuanced messages to collect information and to bring it back to their fathers, and even to go out into the local community during the conference and to meet the local people whose lives have been summarily destroyed by the war and whose futures are being reordered by the conversations that are taking a place around the conference table at that very instant. And those reports they bring back to their fathers are incredibly important. And I think their presence at the conference also allows their fathers to see a physical manifestation of the future in front of them. Of course, there's conversation at the time about we have to secure peace the right way to make the world safe for future generations and our children in the metaphorical sense. But for them, it was literally their daughters, their children who are there with them that are the physical embodiment of that. They're you know, in their mind at the conference each and every day. 
just to close, I, I like to kind of you know, wrap up with a few thoughts about what this story can tell us about history and about the importance of Yalta and the daughters in our world today. And the story for me is really one that's about relationships. Of course, we don't know what it's like to negotiate across the table from Stalin. And so I think sometimes the history of foreign policy or diplomacy or these great summits can feel intimidating to people who maybe don't love to read history because they think it's something that's so far removed from their lives that they can't understand it or appreciate it. But at the end of the day, history is really the story of relationships, of course, between nations and between leaders, but also among families. And we don't know what it's like to negotiate with Stalin, but we all know what it's like to be someone's child or to be someone's parent. And I think that those relationships are really the fundamental underpinning of the story, even amidst all the great geopolitical conflict that's taking place. When we think about the story and its relationship to our world today, the first thing that emerges in my mind is the relationship between Russia and the West. That, of course, has become increasingly important again over the last few weeks as Putin has troops poised on the border with Ukraine. And I think going back all the way to Yalta and the relationship with FDR and Stalin, there's always been this tendency by the American president to lean on the personal relationship with the Soviet or the Russian leader. Unfortunately, the strategy has not worked well ever since 1945. FDR really believed in the powers of personal persuasion, which served him incredibly well in domestic politics and in his relationship with Churchill. But when it came to Stalin, as George Kennan wrote, uh, he at the time was Avril Harriman's number two at the embassy in Moscow, and of course had gone to become one of the wise men of the Cold War. He wrote that uh, invitations to dinner or games of golf are not going to persuade a Soviet bureaucrat to be on your side or to be more flexible in their negotiations. Instead, all they want to pursue is their own interests, especially in foreign policy. And these types of you know, building the personal interpersonal relationship is not going to be materially important in the negotiations. And unfortunately, I think we've seen uh, subsequent American administrations, the Bush, Obama, Trump administration, all kind of lean on this personal bond with Putin. Uh, we'll see how that develops with Biden, and especially over the talks that they're having uh, presently over the next, you know, these past few weeks and going forward, if that interpersonal relationship between the leaders makes a difference. I'm skeptical that it will. I think instead we should try to find areas of mutual cooperation and benefit, um, but that remains to be seen. So I think that's just something important to keep in mind. Also really important, I think, over the last couple of years is this conversation of what's the appropriate role for the unelected family members of elected officials to play in their public duties. To some extent, I think it's kind of like when you marry someone, you marry their family. In a way, when you elect someone, you elect their family too. And we've long agreed that there should be a role of a, a first lady or first spouse in more of an official capacity. But what about first children? Uh, adult first children have been involved in their parents' administrations all the way back to John Quincy Adams, whose son served as principal private secretary. And you've seen first sons act in that role uh, over time. And of course, you know, Ivanka Trump being very involved in her father's uh, presidency. But you know, can we draw a bright line rule about how involved a family member should be? Some family members may come with huge expertise that you want to involve uh, in the runnings of an administration, and others not so much. Uh, but it's one that we hadn't had to grapple with until recently because past presidents uh, and the recent past had had very young children in the White House. So I think it's something important to talk about uh, as Americans. And finally, uh, I'm so glad that we have capabilities like Zoom now to be able to keep having conversations in these difficult times. I'm so glad that we're able to be here in person and also to have people join us on Zoom. So thank you so much for those of you who are tuning in. But I think that the experience of these leaders attending Yalta and undertaking such personal risk and danger to physically get there, to have this meeting with Stalin really speaks to the importance of having these meetings together and conversations in person, as well as the importance that FDR felt about the founding of the UN as a forum to bring diplomats from all around the world together to expedite diplomacy, to understand each other's cultures. And I hope these are things that we don't lose sight of in the world today and as we move forward out of the pandemic. So I'm so glad that we have these tools, but really there's nothing that takes the place of uh, in-person communication. So with that, I will end and just say thank you all for joining, whether you're on Zoom or here in the room. So thank you so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Well, Catherine, what a thorough, compelling presentation. And uh, Catherine is definitely willing to answer a few questions if anyone has some. So uh, just raise your hand. If you... Yes, uh, Jeff. Catherine, um, um, is there anything in the letter for your research that you want to cover about the daughter's ongoing interest in foreign service and diplomacy, and specifically what happened in their relative to the Soviet Union after World War II? 
Absolutely. So I'll just repeat the question if people are on Zoom. Did the daughters have any enduring interest in foreign policy and diplomacy after Yalta and after World War II? Um, yes and no. Personally, absolutely. Sarah Churchill had continued to have a really close bond with her father and also acted as a much of an unofficial advisor to him uh, in the years uh, after the war. And he actually wanted her at his side after he lost the 1945 general election. And she wrote a letter to him just before that about the feelings and sentiments of the people that worked with her uh, at RAF Medmenham, her base, and the people that came from all across Britain. And she advised him that you know, the, the feelings of wanting change was really what was motivating people to vote against him. And it wasn't a vote against him personally, but really just the sense of wanting something different after the suffering of the war. And she is, you know, continues to be this kind of almost like a conscience for him that he turns to and she continues to have this dialogue with him in years uh, that follow, although she goes back to her career as an actress so she doesn't uh, work in politics per se. But I think if she'd been born even 10 years later she might have thought to have, a, she could have had an opportunity in this world which would have made her a contemporary with Margaret Thatcher which would have been really interesting and I think she was the Churchill who was most suited for it. So that's really a shame that we didn't get to benefit from her astute political minds. Kathleen continues her work after the war uh, as a reporter at Newsweek for a while, and then she gets married and has children. Uh, but she consciously didn't want to talk about the war after it was over. Because she'd spent so much time in the Soviet Union, she felt that no matter what she said, she couldn't win. That people would accuse her of either being much too skeptical of the Soviets and the communists or much too sympathetic. And so she just decided to say nothing. And it was really a conscious choice on her part. And her children even didn't realize what kind of role she had during the war. They knew she spoke Russian because she'd sometimes say goodnight to them in Russian and friends who would come over who spoke Russian, she'd speak with them. But they really didn't know the full extent of it until after she died and they discovered a box of letters um, from her, to her sister written during the war that I was able to access while writing the story and I'm really grateful to the family for that. Anna's the one who has the most direct role going forward and it's really kind of both uh, to honor her father and her mother that she takes up some of their work in uh, humanitarian causes and human rights, um, which is very important to Eleanor. And she continues to be a champion of this, not in an official capacity, but she actually has the opportunity to work with Avril Harriman years later uh, in a capacity involving uh, human, rights, human rights in the UN. And that was something that was really important to her and to um, safeguard both of her parents' legacy. <laughs> Yes. Is there any evidence that you would suggest that Sarah and Anna had any influence on their fathers in terms of their negotiating strategy? Sure. Uh, so the question is whether Sarah and Anna had any influence on their father's negotiating strategies at the conference. I would say that it was not a direct influence where you know, it's not like they, you know, we're going to go in and negotiate one way with Stalin and they talked them out of it. I think Anna's most direct role was literally keeping FDR alive the whole time. And unfortunately, that kind of took the role of being kind of a, a blockade against the British and Churchill personally from time to time, where there's so many people that wanted to meet with FDR, and she knew if they all did, he would just be exhausted and couldn't carry out his duties at all. So she would kind of get in the way and say, you can't meet with FDR right now. And she and Harry Hopkins really clashed over this because he felt that he really needed to go into these meetings with a very united front with Churchill to be able to have any kind of hope of negotiating forcefully with Stalin. And FDR didn't want to meet with Churchill because he was exhausted, exhausting and also because his worldview had really changed at that time. He knew they didn't need Britain going forward. The British Empire had really fallen apart in order to, you know, save the rest of the world um, as they fought the war, especially in the early days. And so unfortunately, I think that Anna kind of, not deliberately, I don't think she had the expertise to know this, but Hopkins, this is what Hopkins was really concerned about, that in preventing these meetings, it unfortunately weakened FDR's negotiating position with Stalin. For Sarah, I really, I really think in many ways that she's the conscience of this conference. And she is there kind of like a privy counselor with her father late at night at two in the morning as the, uh, the diplomatic pouch from Downing Street arrives and they're going through the papers and the overnight news. 
And uh, he's able to kind of almost like rehearse in front of her what he's gonna say in the conference rooms the next day. And he's really frustrated with FDR at this point, who he feels doesn't understand the full implications of the threat of the Soviet Union, uh, the fact that they have boots on the ground across Eastern Europe and just how tough it will be to get any kind of meaningful negotiation with Stalin. But he's especially critical of the FDR of not appreciating the significance of Poland going forward. Poland is just not important to FDR politically. It's not gonna turn a lot, number of votes for or against him. Um, and Churchill thinks that FDR is being very short-sighted about this. So he's able to get his frustration out with Sarah. So he can kind of vent to her and then be more productive when he goes into the conference room. But he has to have this outlet for his genuine fears and feelings. And Sarah is the one person that he can share this with. <laughs> Well, Stalin was a, a wily negotiator, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but he also just the, the strength of position that he had, boots on the ground across Eastern Europe and short of declaring war on the Soviet Union when it was over, I don't know that there was a lot that they could do to change his mind. Um, there are always kind of counterfactual conversations about Yalta and if FDR hadn't been so sick, might the outcome have been different? Um, if he had been uh, less naive about Stalin, might it have been different? And unfortunately, I think the things that have been materially different would have required opening the Western Front at least a year earlier so the Soviets couldn't have become so entrenched in the East, which would have required rearmament significantly earlier in both Britain and the United States, and you're getting the decisions that have been made in the 1930s. And so it's kind of this really unsatisfying counterfactual spiral. Uh, but Stalin definitely had the strongest hand there. And uh, I think Churchill was much more aware of that than FDR was. Yes. Yeah. But um, from my understanding was that part of the Yalta, uh, the Yalta conference, that, so, that Russia was giving a veto vote to the Was that something that was on the table before, you know, and how did Churchill feel about that? I was just curious, because that's obviously been a, you know, an ongoing issue ever since, ever since it happened. Absolutely. So the, the question for folks on Zoom is about uh, the Soviet Union being given a veto vote within the UN and the complicated relationship, the UN with the Soviet Union and Britain at the time. And so what's really interesting about the, the matter of the, the votes in the General Assembly, which is it's kind of the General Assembly, which is more of the sticking point at this at this time than the veto votes of the permanent members of the Security Council. And it was kind of accepted that if the Soviet Union became part of it, that they would be one of the most important partners. And uh, FDR really saw the UN as a way of bringing the Soviet Union into the international community when the war was over and recognizing the real power that they had on the world stage. So for FDR, that wasn't as much of a concern as it was for Churchill. But the Soviet Union wanted to make sure that, well, what, what they wanted was to have 16 separate votes in the General Assembly for the Soviet republics. And Churchill was up in arms about this. <laughs> you can't do this, you, know, you can't have this much power. Meanwhile, he wanted some of the Commonwealth countries and com countries of the British Empire to also have individual votes. He really wanted India to have its own vote within the UN. And so Stalin used this to say, you know, if Churchill gets India to have its own vote, why can't I have Ukraine and Belarus have their own vote? And so this is a really difficult area because Churchill and Stalin are actually kind of aligned on this point, which is odd. And yet Churchill doesn't want Stalin to have the very thing that he's trying to negotiate for. Um, so in the end, the Soviets are not given 16 separate votes, they're only given three. And it's Ukraine, Ukraine and Belarus um, are given their own vote. Um, but Churchill, uh, I think, is it's a really complicated position to see him negotiating around um, and continue to see the strengths and weaknesses of the UN and the Security Council right now. I mean, looking at Kazakhstan, there's not going to be a UN vote among the you know, five members because you're not going to bring Russia to the table to it certainly, you know, would never vote in favor of action <laughs> there because it's contrary to their interests. So it's just one of those inherent weaknesses I think that we're living with ever since. And you know, that's a, an argument at least, you know, many people have about has you know, the Security Council structure outlived its usefulness. So I don't know. <laughs> yes. So the only uh, woman that was of the three that had the other 
Uh, Clementine Churchill was also alive and she was a, a huge partner for Churchill at the time. She was really afraid of flying, so she didn't like to travel during the war, so she was happy to have one of her daughters do it instead. Um, but she, she, uh, she's alive and well and continues to be for a long time. Yeah, the mother-daughter relationships are really interesting. There's a lot of similarities between Clementine Churchill and Eleanor Roosevelt. Both of them really struggled with um, balancing their own kind of ambitions in the world and also for Clementine. And she really, she even said to her daughter, Mary, at one point, I recognize that I could either be a great wife and partner to Winston or a great mother, and I chose to be a great partner to Winston and at the expense of being a mother. Uh, both Eleanor and Clementine had a kind of a complicated relationship with motherhood. It wasn't something that they naturally wanted to, to do as much. I think Clementine Churchill, some people think today, struggled with postpartum depression after she had children. She had a really hard time with that. Um, Eleanor was hugely capable and brilliant, and that role of kind of mother and kind of compared to what she was capable of doing you know, in the political arena, it was kind of at odds. And um, so unfortunately, I think for their children, they didn't necessarily have that kind of parental relationship that they were looking for. Um, Anna didn't really get it at all from either parent. Sarah got it much more from Winston than from Clementine, which is interesting. But you know, it's a really similar experience that both of these girls grew up with. And for each of them, their relationships with their mothers improved as they got older. Um, I think both Clementine and Eleanor were able to relate to adult children much better than young children. Um, but it was really hard for them growing up. And so I think you can see some of the similar struggles that they faced and the Kathleen Perriman, her mother died when she was very young, so she didn't even have that figure. So uh, very sad all around. Yes. So this is a little off the wall, but there is a lot of her that she didn't even know that she was just found out. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how she was able to get that information. Yes, uh, Svetlana Stalin, uh, Stalin's daughter, is a very interesting character. She was 19 at the time in Yalta, and she did speak English, so she could have been a daughter diplomat and very useful to her father as well, but he did not like her to engage with foreigners, especially Westerners, and very few uh, visitors ever met her. Uh, Churchill was one of the few, and he met her once when he came to Moscow in 1942, and Stalin brought her out before dinner, almost like a prop, to say, look, I'm a family man too, which is very odd. And uh, Svetlana had uh, red hair, as did Churchill and Sarah Churchill. And Churchill has this little conversation in English with Svetlana. And he says that she, she reminds him of his daughter, Sarah, who's also a redhead. And so afterwards, Svetlana sends Sarah a brooch kind of as this gesture to daughter to daughter diplomacy. And Sarah wears it on her uniform throughout the conference, which is a lovely gesture. But there's a, the, Svetlana and Stalin have a horrible relationship at this point. Svetlana learned as a teenager that her mother had committed suicide and was really driven to it by Stalin's cruelty. And so Svetlana rebels against this, she's you know, obviously distraught, and she starts an affair with a significantly older uh, Soviet uh, Jewish cinematographer. And Stalin takes exception to this. And so he decides to send the man off to Siberia, literally sends to Gulag. Uh, Svetlana is very upset. And then she rebels again at 19. And she uh, starts a relationship with one of her classmates named Grigory Morozov, who's also Jewish. And they get engaged and get married. And uh, Stalin refuses to ever meet his son-in-law. Uh, he doesn't approve that he's Jewish. Um, and so it's just kind of what's taking place in Svetlana's life at the time of Yalta. And uh, she's pregnant with her first child at the time. 19 years old, kind of really alone in the world in many ways, and has a really complicated life and ends up defecting to the United States years later after her father dies. But God, what a horrible position to be in to be Stalin's daughter. Any other questions for Catherine? Yep. Thank you.
church in all that while these daughters were looking for relationships with the father, the relationship of family, the relationship of country, and you tie it together with a true enough picture of what we know from history uh, the sorrowful, the proud, the challenge that these women try to preserve a family's integrity and a country integrity. And my friends, who are my age and not my anymore, um, really love that. You have a magical gift. Continue that. They love it. They oh. love it. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. That's really, really very kind. Thank you so much to, for reading it and to your friends for reading it and just I kind of had one word on my desk while I was writing the story and that was relationships that I really wanted that to be the heart of the story. So thank you so much for, for sharing your feedback of that with me. And I'm so glad that that came through in the story as you read it. So thank you. It just really means so much to me to hear that. And um, thank you all so much for coming this evening. It's just been so nice to meet all of you. And, and yeah. let me, let me just say, uh, First, obviously, thank you, Catherine. I mean, what a great presentation and uh, a nice, true comment about her magical gift, as well as a speaker. I mean, just very uh, intelligent and sharp. And uh, I just want to say that Catherine is going to sign books back there in that part of the room. So I urge you to, to get one and sign it for yourself or a friend or a family member. And uh, Catherine, again, thank you. What a great, great Yes, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.